I'm Chip Hanna, and this is the For You Leaders Podcast, featuring Kirk Dando, where we truly go beyond the veneer. You'll experience the raw and the real of leadership. You'll see your feet not miles away from the top. A goal without a plan is just a wish. If you aim at nothing, you hit it every time. By failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. In preparing for battle, I have always found that the plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. A fool with a plan can outsmart a genius with no plan any day. Failing to plan is planning to fail. The English language is full of idioms and cliches about having a plan, but how many organizations really have a plan and one that works? You know, most organizations have an idea, generally, of where they want to go to, but rarely Do they really have a clear picture? If you stop and ask people inside the organization, do some skip level discussions, they can tell you the general direction, north, south, east, west, but usually when pressed and asked how they impact that and what that destination is, the conversation falls off. Why why do you think that is? You know, it's it's tough. I mean, it, it takes a lot of time and effort to get to that level of granularity. It's about trading efficiency for today for the efficiency that you really need tomorrow. Meaning you gotta take time to do justice to the issues. It's like Eisenhower's quote, in preparing for battle, I have always found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. The actual plan you create isn't mind blowing. In fact, if you showed it to somebody else, it probably wouldn't be that impressive. It's the conversations, it's the alignment that went into the plan that helped create what it ends up being the focus and the attention that people are able to attach their daily activities to. Today, we're talking with Tim Hawks. He's the head pastor at Hill Country Bible Church about their strategic plan. Yes, even churches and nonprofits need a strategy. They need a plan. This isn't a sermon, and we don't have a hidden religious or political agenda. I encourage you to listen how Tim Hawks, a fantastic leader, and his organization approach their strategic planning process. We also talk about how he prepares for talks every single week. He's getting up in front of thousands of people. How does he go about getting prepared to to clearly inspire and convey the message that he has to do? Listen, and I think you're really going to enjoy what you can learn from Tim today. Many churches, and I think many organizations, they, uh, they draw the bullseye after they've fired. And so they, they always claim success, but they didn't intend for it to be that way. And, and so what we found with our team is if we do not have unified direction and we're simply running out and looking at the good things that are happening and drawing a bullseye around them, nobody really knows whether they're going to succeed or fail. And so we, we've been involved in a process. Kirk has helped us. We've pulled our key leaders That would be our lay elders, the people that are not paid but give leadership to the church, and our executive staff together. And we sat down and we spent days talking, praying, and prioritizing five goals for the year for our church. And those goals have more to do with developing people, encouraging people, strengthening people than they do with developing organizational aspects or pulling off events. We still have events. We still do things in an organized way, but how are we really working with our people? After wrestling with this, praying about this, we spent two days really kind of locked ourselves in a room and we just, we put the goals down. Here are the ones we've committed to. We argued about, you know, which, which is the right thing. We landed on five And then we went to the 50,000 foot level of asking the question, what would the church look like a year from now if we accomplish these goals? Then the uh, lay elders sent the executive team off to work on the 30,000 foot level and the 10,000 foot level. And we put in place this overall view of how this would look. And then we went back to every ministry area And we ask them to plan their year with these goals in mind. And that was pretty challenging because people had to uh, stop doing some things that they'd always done, and they had to start doing some things that they hadn't done before. That's where we found out 
uh, whether our communication was actually clear, where people were gaining clarity, and so they understood. And then we started the year with a 30-day review of the goals, simply asking the question, what do we accomplish in the first 30 days related to these goals? Not what did we do, not what were our activities, but what did we actually do to advance the goal? In fact, we actually developed a little motto that we were using with our teams now, and that is every team advances every goal every month. And so we go through each of the goals with each of the teams, and we ask the question, what happened this month to advance this goal? That gets rolled up into a collective report that we give to our, our team so that they can see the progress we're making. And it's gone a long way to helping people understand what's most important and how they on a day-to-day -day basis can accomplish what's most important. So we talked about this earlier, just in that, that keeping that communication. I mean, and, there, and I appreciate describing the process because I think oftentimes people think the outcome is what matters. And it's kind of like that. I can't remember if, it, if it's Visa or MasterCard, but that old commercial, you know, you know, here's the, the points that are, you know, you, you know, as far as we have the goals or we, or we have, you know, uh, the, the plan that's going to support those goals and all those things are, you know, ha have a price of time and effort and energy, but, but the process is what's priceless. I mean, the outcome is candidly is useless. And what I mean by that, it's useless in the sense that if you handed it to somebody else, to another organization, to another church, their ability to really be able to execute and implement on that is going to be negligible. However, the process of building those relationships of having those discussions over and over and over it's just amazing you know you think about anything in your life that you focused on you probably have come close to accomplishing and or either got better information and realized you didn't need to accomplish it but that that attention to focus that process is is so powerful and, and you know at any point you can claim victory and at any point you can claim failure in that process <laughs> That, that's very true. And what we're experiencing here that's been really, really positive is we used to look at quarterly and annually, progress annually and quarterly. And the challenge is if, you, if you're off, if you're not on focus and you go a whole quarter, you've just you've spent one fourth of your year misdirected. And at that point in time, there's tension with your supervisor, there's tension with your the executive that's over your area, there's tension internally, and now you've got three quarters of a year to try to accomplish what you thought that you were going to or what, or, or even redirect. And so by doing this every 30 days, at the end of 30 days, you can make adjustments and redirect and make sure that you're on the same page. And so the process is extremely valuable for giving the employee confidence that they're not going to get too far down the road and find out they're in, on the wrong road. And, and building out that relational network, holding that signal strength, like you said, if you go a full quarter, you know, and, and you have to redirect, that's when you do start hearing, well, we've got to hire more people, we've got to get more done and everything else like that, because there's this, all of a sudden there's urgency of like, we're not getting it done, so we've got to do this, versus kind of that, those slight course corrections along the way that really do empower them to, one, get the clarity that they need so they can in, turn around and be the leader that we've described and discussed here, where people want to follow and get involved in a meaningful way, but that, you know, keeping that, that signal strength oftentimes is a good mental way to think about, you know, are we able to, to the furthest reaches? And it's, like I said, it's even more difficult in, a, in an organization where there's, you know, it's mostly driven by, by volunteers and the, and the people, the commitments that they have, they're, they're voting with their feet and with their hearts. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and one of the mistakes that I made in the past is I, I would say, well, I've, I've hired good managers, so I'm assuming that they're meeting with their people and they're helping them make these course corrections. What I fail to recognize is that if I have a manager that doesn't completely understand the goals and direction, then they're actually directing their team to work on the wrong things. And if we go a quarter and we don't realize that the the manager's actually missing the mark 
then we've disenfranchised the whole team. So by doing it every 30 days, this process of really looking at the most important things every 30 days with every team, we ensure that the executive team, the managers, and the team are all on the same page, and then all of our volunteers. So the efficiency of that is more than the time that's spent is more than made up with the efficiency of not having to re recorrect or you know go into crisis mode because we're so far off. Yeah, and I think you've answered this question by your response, but I'll just ask ask it anyways. Is I mean it's a major commitment of time and effort and energy. Is it worth it? I would say the time, effort, energy is is worth it because the result that you see is exponential in nature. And not only the result, but the ownership. When people are telling me what I've been telling them, and they're saying it to me with the kind of conviction that I've been telling them, I know that they've not only gotten it, but they're owning it, they believe it, they're living it, they're accomplishing it. And if I have 100 people telling me what the goals are, instead of me, one person telling 100 people what the goals are, whatever it took to get there was definitely worth it. Okay, good, good. So let's talk a little bit about failure. I think failure has a way of shaping people. Sometimes it unfortunately takes them in a direction that, that sends them on a path and a journey that's not overly helpful. But but either way, pain and failure has a way of shaping us. Talk a little bit about how failure has shaped you as a leader. Well, it it's failure has profound effect on uh, causing reflection and evaluation. So uh, the first thing I think I learned along the way is that if I'm frustrated uh, and I'm the leader, that the problem is with me, not with somebody else. And that the struggle with frustration, thinking that we were moving forward to find out that we're not, or thinking that we agreed to find out that we're on a different page, and the frustration of feeling like I've lost an opportunity, time, vision, resources have been expended and we've missed an opportunity. That that level of frustration that comes out of that's really challenged me to take a look at what was my contribution. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, I'm the leader. So if it's not going well, uh, where's the mirror? I mean, it, it's got to, it, I have to be contributing it to it in some way, shape or form. So one of the things that I feel like I learned through this process, and I really feel like God was speaking to me and telling me is that if I'm frustrated with another team member, I have to assume that they're equally frustrated with me. And then it forces me to ask myself the question, why would they be frustrated with me and work on that? Maybe I haven't been clear enough. Maybe I haven't given them enough time. Maybe I haven't respected their thoughts or ideas. Maybe they don't have the gifting to do the job, and I'm insisting that they do, and they really need to be redirected to another role or to another ministry or another a type of job. So whatever, whenever I am frustrated with someone else, the quicker I can ask myself, well, then why would they be frustrated with me? Now I actually have something to work on. Yeah, that's really good. I think that too many times we don't take the time to kind of step back and say, what's my role in this? And I think something that you're very, very good about, and it's it's kind of hard to talk about ourselves sometimes, I understand, but one of the things that I think you're really good about is you, you have a circle of people around you that you allow to speak into your blind spots. And you really listen, even if it doesn't make sense, you know, on, you know, initially, or maybe not at all, you act on that advice because you have built the trust in those folks and you ask, you actively ask on a regular basis for feedback. One of the things that I read in the Bible on a regular basis is this call, do not be deceived. You come across that in numerous places where um, something in the Bible says, do not be deceived. Well, you know, when I look at that, I always, it, it always kind of uh, throws me off a bit because the, the very nature of deception means you would you wouldn't know it if you were. <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that, that's the idea of deception. So then, then the question is, what, what's, what's the command actually challenging you? And the command is actually challenging you to open up the, the sphere of influence around you so that people can show you when you are deceived. They can, they can speak into that. 
And so, you know, blind spots, everybody has blind spots, but the nature of the blind spot means that I won't know that I have it unless I allow somebody to speak into it. So that's been something that's very important to me. I'll leave a meeting, and if there's a tense tone in the meeting, I will ask two or three people, what what was going on there and what was my part? What were people getting from me? And that's just fascinating, Uh, being able to see things that you brought to the table that you were not aware of, that's that's just, it's been a journey in self-discovery. And every day I'm surprised again when I open that door up and just ask people, and it helps me a lot. And it, and it strengthens my relationships because now I can go back to people and clarify or apologize and regain that trust to be able to move forward. Yeah, yeah, and there's that, there's that word trust again. I mean, it's it's a journey you know, it's not a, a destination. It's not a title. It's not a, it's, there's not a finish line. It is a journey. And I know it's over the obvious and embarrassingly simple stating the obvious, but you're very intentional and, and really, you know, people that are worth following and the great leaders really are very intentional. It never stops getting better. Well, it's gr- growth is a, an ongoing process and I, I get a lot of good feedback from people. So that, that's been one of the best sources and even if I don't think that they they captured it, they capture something. And impression is an impression. Yeah, um, yeah. I can't change somebody's impression, but I can learn from it. And then I can do my part to, to make myself more clear or available to them. Yeah. Well, I just have a couple more questions. I can go on and on here. I'm, I'm really enjoying this. I appreciate your time. So one of the things you, you know, you are – from being able to share a message and a vision, you are one of the best I have ever seen at communicating, you know, through a sermon, through discussions. Talk a little bit about your process of getting prepared because I think leaders, you know, oftentimes whether it's in front of a group of one or in front of a group of thousands, have this need to be prepared and communicate. What's your process look like? You're doing it on, you know, on a regular basis, definitely weekly. Well, it, it's a complicated process on a technical scale, but on just if you take a step back, I think one of the biggest motivating factors to people is your value proposition. Why would I, as an individual, follow you or do what you're calling me to do? What value is that to me and to the world? And if you can clearly articulate what that is, and you personally believe it, then I think that you can go a long way in really motivating people to move with you. I think that if there is a perception of ulterior motives, or for example, if at the end of the day, um, we want you to bring all your friends so that we can grow and become a really big church so that I'll be a really important person, and people see that or feel that, they won't go very far with you. And same thing with the company. If, if at the end of the day, the goal is, is that as a CEO, uh, you're going to be able to take the company public and you're going to, you know, be able to buy an island in, you know, the Pacific someplace to live on the rest of your life and enjoy your life. But if you can truly communicate the value of what your organization, your company can do and how it will benefit people, and then you believe that, you will find words and ways to communicate that. It comes from who you are and what your, your values are. That, that's good. That's really good. I'm going to butcher this a little bit, but this is some advice that you gave me once about, you know, just about speaking, which I really enjoy doing. Uh, and it's, you know, it's like anything else. It's, a, it's an art and a science that you have to get better at. But one of the things you told me is, is to think about in your message too, is just think about what do you want people to know? What do you want people to feel, and what do you want people to do? Did I did I get that right? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. So that was a powerful piece of advice. The other thing is is that you said, you know, in speaking, oftentimes when people begin speaking, they are so focused on on how they look initially, and and they're so concerned about that, they get kind of wrapped around the axle. And as they do more of it, they kind of move into this where they're more content focused. Like, is my content really good? And the more mature, more influential, impactful speakers move into this kind of third phase where they're just truly focused on the people that they're speaking to and how they can add value to them. Did I, did I get that right? 
That is exactly right. The, the th from moving from a novice communicator to an effective communicator, I believe almost everybody walks through those three stages. And first stage is self-focus. Second stage is content focus. And the third stage is audience focus. And audience focus doesn't mean you don't have content. You've got to have content. It doesn't mean that you're not aware of yourself and how you communicate. You've got to be self-aware. But when you get through those first two stages and now you're actually having a conversation with the audience, not because they're speaking back, but because you're reading their signals and you know who they are and you know what they feel and what they need because in your preparation, you've given a lot of thought to who these people are and how they feel and why they think what they think. Um, that's when communication becomes effective and fun. That's that. That's really good. I, I wish uh, I wish I would have had that piece of advice when I very first got started, but but I got it along the way, and it was super helpful for me. So I'm hoping people that are listening that are, that are involved in you know speaking in some form or fashion that that uh, helps you uh, frame out ways to get prepared. A lot of people have a preconceived notion about pastors, good or bad, you know, based on you know their experience or whatever. What is something about you that might surprise people that are listening? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> At the end of the day, I'm a, re a relatively boring person, I think. You like you like uh, Michigan State? I do like Michigan State, and this year they're not doing very well. No. So, um, I, <laughs> well, I, I we like, can move beyond that. <laughs> yes, exactly. I, I think that the thing about me that's really interesting, from probably from the leadership standpoint, is I really love what I'm doing. I really believe in what I'm doing. And if I wasn't getting paid, I'd be doing this anyway. This is just what, what I really enjoy. And seeing people's lives transformed, it, it actually, I kind of feel like I get to sit in the place where I see God working every day in a thousand different situations. And a lot of people just they see the glimpses in their own life or maybe in their close friends. I get to see the whole thing. And so I just feel like I'm extremely blessed as an individual. And I really think in many cases, most pastors, they have that same desire. And some of them, either because of a gifting issue or because of a training issue or circumstances, they find themselves uh, running minutia every day and just kind of taking care of, of small things. I know thousands of pastors across the country, and I'd say if, if you if you've had a bad experience with one, just look for another one. Yeah, <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna find a lot of good men and women out there. That's very 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 true. I've yeah, that's that's a great piece of advice. A couple more questions, and we'll wrap up here. You know, what is uh, the first time that you recall really knowing that you were called to be a leader? Do you, can you remember that time? Is there a certain instance or event? Well, that's a really good question. If you talk to my mother, um, you're going to get something different than talking to me because my mom said that I was the kid in the family who always told everybody what to say and what to do. So I guess I was bossing opinionated from an early age. But for some reason um, in my wiring, this sense that there's a, a good way to do things and there's a lot that can be accomplished – just kind of came natural to me. And so over the course of my life, I found myself in these different leadership positions, not because I really had a big desire to be there in the position, but because I saw something that could be accomplished. And really all through my growing up, through school, when I got into my, in college and seminary, and so all along the way, there was this sense in which um, – there's something out there that needs to be done, and um, I have some insight into how to get it done. And so much more organic than there was a moment when it dawned on me. Yeah, I really like that story about your mom because part of the reason we're doing these podcasts is, you know, I've had, I, I mean, I, I don't know, 20,000 conversations over the last 20 years with people and I've never claimed to be the brightest bowl, but it just kind of occurred to me that I'm having so many meaningful conversations and there are so many patterns that, that if people could just hear, would encourage them, would normalize their journey, would, would give them hope and give them maybe that extra little boost that they need to just keep taking their next step. But one of the things that I 
constantly hear when I ask people that question because I almost ask every person I talk to that question is they they relate it back to someone in their life at a young age that saw something in them that they didn't see in themselves so so fast forward that and think about your life today think about those young people in your life today that are you're listening that you may be that spark that encouragement that you see something in somebody that they may not see in themselves something that it hasn't been nurtured brought out encouraged and I think as as people sometimes we take for granted just in our daily activities especially with young people how powerful our sincere authentic voice can be and so I I mean it is every single great leader I've ever asked tells me a story about a teacher a parent a coach somebody along the way that saw something in them that they didn't see in themselves and planted that seed that is now causing them to have a huge impact in this world in a very positive way. So I really love that story and, you know, how your mom, you know, saw that, you know, in you. In the church, we call that speaking prophetically into people's lives or prophesying into people's lives, which is uh, not the hocus pocus, well, here's what I see in your future crystal ball type thing, but actually looking into somebody's life, seeing a characteristic, and then projecting that characteristic out into their future and empowering them through that. And I I totally agree with you. I think there's so many people that are just waiting for someone to notice something and to tell them what this could look like. And with armed with that confidence that they receive from someone else, uh, they can change the world. Yeah. And it doesn't, it's so simple to do yet in our daily activities, we get in such a hurry. Sometimes we miss that. Obviously we want to do that for our kids and the people that are closest to us, but it may be that person that's checking us out at the grocery store. It may be someone that's playing on the soccer team that, you know, their future is not going to be you know playing soccer, their future is something else, but we get so wrapped up in, in what, what's in front of us winning or accomplishing the task. So I, I, that, I really appreciate you sharing this. So this is the last question is, what is one piece of advice for the people that are listening that you want to share about leadership that you've learned and that, you know, maybe be something that you have shared with your kids or people that are close to you? What is the, the one or two things that you would want them to hear and take away from this? Well, obviously, as a pastor, um, that my relationship with God significantly influences how I think. And there may be many of you uh, on that are listening to the podcast that, Maybe you have a relationship with God, maybe you don't believe that there is a God, or you've never explored the spiritual dimension of you, but in many ways, the the vision and mission of accomplishing something speaks to a spark that someplace inside the human soul um, is, is, is burning, and it may be burning it as an ember or... I think in really great leaders, it's oftentimes burning as a flame. But I would encourage you to explore the spiritual side of your life. I think that when you are leading from a place of deep spiritual passion, um, when you're connected to a transcendent cause that's bigger than yourself and just bigger than what you can get for yourself or accomplish, it, it changes the way you think about leadership. It changes the way you view people and the world. And so clearly in my life, my relationship with Jesus Christ has become that spark that has ignited a passion in me to see people connect with God and grow and experience the fullness of the abundant life that is offered in a relationship with God. But I think within every person, uh, there is a spiritual dynamic. And so that, that would be my advice to explore that spiritual dynamic. Don't let your life simply be lived in the materialistic world of what you can see, touch, taste, and feel without having something deeper than that to experience, enjoy, and to uh, live for as you, you move forward in your leadership. Yeah, that's, that's really good. I, you know, it is really a call to just explore, right? I mean, that's that's really what you're, you're saying. And I think that, you know, Zig Ziglar used to say this, and I think it's so true. You know, what I know and I know that I know is that there's a God. It's not you and it's not me. <laughs> and so, you know, being able to explore that, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, in the world that we live in, people are going to hurt people, hurt people, you know, the saying goes, hurt people, hurt people. And I think oftentimes, you know, whether Christian or whatever it is, you know, those, those things are happening out there, but you still have 
the ability and the freedom which is great to to explore and discover for yourself and draw your own conclusions you know and don't just look at the people that are in front of you because you know in any given day that's going to change but to explore that relationship that's that's really good well tim thank you very much i we went way over time here and i really appreciate this has been really good How, how'd you feel about it Hey, I feel great about it, Kirk. And just uh, appreciate the time that we've been able to spend together. You've taught me a lot, given me a lot of direction, and uh, the work that you're doing with us now. I'm so excited about that. And hopefully, what we've talked about here will be helpful to your listeners. Yeah, yeah it absolutely will be. So, were you surprised by Tim's thought about a strategic plan? I know I was a little bit surprised that you know that a church would would think and structure themselves this way. So, ask yourself. Do you have a strategic plan, a real strategic plan? Is it something that you is inside your head? Is it something that you created in a small team, kind of in a vacuum, if you will? Or did you include other people? Did you get what I say? Did you get everybody's fingerprints on the murder weapon? Meaning it's really hard to really put a plan together and then walk out and hand it to people and have them really own it. But if if you can get them to own it by being part of it, implementation and execution and passion for delivering on the outcomes increases significantly. So let's take a page out of Tim's playbook. He talks about no feel do. It's a really great framework. Think about the next time you have to give a talk or you're going to be leading a meeting. If you can get clarity around what you want people to know, what you want them to feel and what you want them to do, it's going to help you communicate more clearly and more concisely. So let's take a page out of Tim's playbook and apply this to the strategic planning So, no, about the ways that you can really manage your organizations. That's what a strategic plan is really going to help you do and help you start to communicate. Feel. Is it okay if you feel inefficient today to help you be efficient for tomorrow? Trust me, the results will be worth it. And do this. Find ways to provide more feedback to you and to your team to be able to create that alignment that will actually create game-changing results. So... What did you think about today's podcast? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Either way, I'd love to hear from you, please. Go to foryouleaders.com. Once again, that's foryouleaders.com. Leave us a comment. If you have other leaders that you think we should be getting on this podcast or there's subject matters that you want us to focus on, let us know that too, and we will do that. Until the next time, thank you for listening.